Oh, yeah, it's about to get loud. We're talking about Sabbath. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Listography. Jason here with Joe and Kramzer. Got myself set up in a new space for recording. Um, so we'll see. It's a work in progress, but at least I'm not crammed between my bed and window anymore. Although we do have some stuff that we've already recorded. So I may be ping ponging back and forth between the spaces for a little bit, but uh, hopefully this looks a little bit better. Uh, we got a big listography today. This week we are covering Black Sabbath. 19 albums to rank. A lot of different singers and band members and personnel changes. So uh, a lot to get to. As far as familiarity with them, uh, for myself, I knew 13 of the albums pretty well. Never really listened to any of the Tony Martin albums before. There's five of those. And I never listened to 13. The most recent one with Ozzy back in the fold. So the, that was new to me as well. But everything else I, I was pretty familiar with. How about you guys? I listened to a lot of Black Sabbath growing up. I got pretty much all the albums for really cheap, like used copies at CD Warehouse back in like 03, 04, 05. So I'm pretty sure I knew all of the Aussie stuff except for 13, but hadn't really listened to all of them until we did last summer, the albums of the year from, you know, like the 70 to 75 range. From an iPod where like back in the day where you would bring your iPod and like get stuff off other people's iTunes. I had a bunch of like 80s, just songs, not albums on my iPod that I would go through. So I can't say that I know anything outside of like the classic Black Sabbath all the way through until now. You know, I love Black Sabbath. I like Dio Sabbath. And we'll leave it at that. So, Joe, what about you? Uh, I honestly did not know that both Ian Gillen and Glenn Hughes released Black Sabbath albums as lead singers like I, I mean i knew i knew ozzy i knew dio i knew the 90s guy tony martin but i guess i missed out on um seven star and born again because i was like what what is this when i heard him but other than that i'm very familiar with the uh, earlier stuff obviously 1980 uh heaven and hell won my album of the year and 1980 nothing to sneeze at one of my top six or seven years of all time, as far as your music goes. And volume four made my top five in 72. I'll leave it at that as far as how much I like them. You'll find out pretty quickly. All of their albums are were just like on the cusp in the 70s. It's a lot of competition. A lot of their best albums came out in years where there's just a ton of competition. But uh, Sabbath rules, I'll just say that. Easy to forget the Deep Purple guys because they just had one apiece, right? So... They should have had, they should have given Coverdale an album. Like, it would have been awesome. Okay. So, as we often do with the larger discographies, we're going to cover a few at a time until we get to the top 10. And then we'll go one by one. Since there's 19, it's easy to divide it up into groups of three. So, we're going to do the bottom three and so on from there. I want to start so we can kind of build up because I love Black Sabbath as, as well, but probably not as much as you outside of the classic stuff. So my very bottom is going to be Forbidden. I don't dismiss all of the Tony Martin stuff, but this one is really, really bad. This is a one-star album for me. Illusion of Power right off the bat. Really weird spoken word thing. It's trying to be like grunge and mainstream or something and just some terrible lyrics all over the place. Um, the next one, my number 18, also a one-star. You know, my top two Black Sabbath albums were like really battling for the number one spot and these two battled for the bottom. Um, also, something I really couldn't stand was Born Again, but in a different way, I thought that this was very laughable. I literally laughed out loud sometimes. I don't think he was the right choice to sing on this album. I think like he's got like this old school blues rock kind of bounces off everything and it did not gel well. And then my number 17, much better than these bottoms too, but still pretty bland and generic. Just sounds like an ordinary of the time metal album is going to be the eternal idol doesn't stand out ancient warriors okay nightmare is kind of cool that might just be because it was an attempt to get on the nightmare on elm street 3 soundtrack and i love that movie but um uh, it's not bad it's just it's 
pretty uh, pretty forgettable. So those are my bottom three. Interesting. Uh, for me, my bottom three, it's all going to be Tony Martin. Number 19, Forbidden. Uh, Ice-T is on the opening track, and I love him in Law and & Order, and I think he has a great Twitter feed. Uh, number 18, Cross Purposes. Geezer Butler comes back for this one, but doesn't sound good. You know, the, the Tony Martin stuff kind of sounds like White Snake, and this kind of just sounds like trying maybe to get back to the Black Sabbath glory days, but it's even uh, less successful than their sort of 80s white, uh, white snake phase. 17, I got Tear or Tur, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not great. It's uh, pretty much just trading satanic imagery for like Norse god imagery and the music just isn't interesting. And, you know, it's, it's just not a not a great album and Tony Martin is just you know he's forgettable and sort of like wanting to be David Coverdale and it just it doesn't really work for me I don't like hate any of these albums uh, Forbidden is really bad but the other two are just a little too generic and uh, uninteresting especially coming from all the great Sabbath stuff it just doesn't hit the mark for me all right so I don't go as low as Cram. I think Sabbath for me bottoms out at two stars, but the worst one for me is the Eternal Idol. Tony Martin comes in and Tony Martin, I'm not a huge fan. He's okay. His voice is decent, but it's not distinct at all. There's like no character to it. He hits all the notes and it sounds good, but it's not memorable. And I think particularly here where he enters the band is a They're just not sounding very inspired. The production's very, very soft, kind of wimpy. It's not quite hair metal, but it's just kind of weak metal. It's it's not heavy at all. So that's bottom for me. A slight step up from there at number 18, I have Headless Cross. This record is got similar issues that the Eternal Idol does. And I don't think this record even sounds as good as the Eternal Idol. The drums especially sound very, very boxy, but... Cozy Powell comes in and is playing the drums and they're played very well. And it gives the uh, the record a little bit more oomph than Eternal Idol has. And then at number 17, I have Forbidden. You know, aside from the Ice-T appearance, I think this record is okay. I think the 90s production works better than the late 80s sound. It's a little heavier, a little has a little more balls to it. But yeah, the songwriting is not great and it's more sort of forgettable Tony Martin stuff. So those are my bottom three. All right, my number 16. These are all kind of like two star, you know, not the worst stuff ever. Just pretty lousy and borderline bad. Um, I've got number 16, seventh star, a little bit of like Brit metal influence, but also kind of like Jason was saying around that same time, borderline on like hair metal. It's just kind of wimpy, although some of it is nice and tuneful. I think Danger Zone is all right. Generally, I have this plight, like I like some metal, like regardless of the genre, but most of the time I think it's kind of just decent or good, rarely great, but far like there's also more occasions where I just think it's straight up bad. And this one is just kind of lousy for me. Number 15, I've got the return of Ozzy with 13. The vibe is cool. It's nice to have Ozzy back, but this album's really sluggish and like Zeitgeist is okay. Live forever. This has, this is the worst sounding um, Black Sabbath album because of Jason's favorite producer compressing the hell out of everything. It sounds loud, no matter how low you turn the volume. It's just everything sounds like trash. And then at number 14, I don't, I think I probably like uh, Martin is more than either of you guys probably my third favorite singer they do cross purposes you know not not as much of like the biblical angels and demons sort of stuff a little more rugged sound than the other martin stuff but yeah nothing nothing too great so i got cross purposes at number 13 14 excuse me all right moving down my list uh number 16 we got probably my most disappointing of all of the the Sabbath records, Dehumanizer. I don't know, it's so dark and brooding and compared to Mob Rules and uh, Heaven and Hell, it's just so uninteresting. Uh, Everything that made those two albums great is missing here. Dio sounds angry, but kind of like just out of his elements. I don't know, all just all the cool riffs and all the cool acrobatic guitar stuff that Tony was doing and that bright, wonderful bass by geezer butler is not here it just ruins it for me big disappointment as far as 
That goes number 15. I got Headless Cross, which is, again, I mean, it's fine, but it's just so generic. And like, even uh, Tony Iommi, who can basically make any song awesome, just the riffs just aren't there for me. It's just not, not that interesting. The best moment of the whole album is probably when Brian May pops in for a guitar solo. At number 14, I got 13. At 14, I like sort of the throwback to the sludgy early Sabbath stuff, but it's just not, you know, it's just not the same. It's, just, it's so hard to compare because it, it almost, I mean, it's almost there. Like it, it wants to be classic Sabbath, but it's just not as good. They're old now. They just don't have the fire. It just stuff you've already heard, just slightly worse. So it's decent though. I'm, I'm not saying it's bad. It's not an embarrassing comeback or anything. It's just not that interesting. All right, number 16 for me is Tear. I think this album sounds a lot better than The Headless Cross, and I think it does actually rock pretty hard, but it's still generic sounding. And, you know, given the choice, if, if your mom takes you to the record store when you're 12 years old or whatever and gives you enough money to buy one CD, uh, you'd be better served by picking out one of the Dio albums from this same time period rather than this. Number 15, I've got Cross Purposes. I think of the Tony Martin albums, this is the best sounding, heaviest, hardest rocking. Uh, right before this album, Dio came back and they did Dehumanizer, which I think is one of their heaviest records. And I actually think it's pretty good. I don't know what Joe's talking about, but then Tony Martin comes back and they try their best to keep that momentum going. And Tony Martin just doesn't have the, the swag or the voice to really, you know, match what they did with Dio. My number 14 is 13, Rick Rubin Producing, who I think I've made it known on this channel before. I am not a fan of Rick Rubin as a producer. You've also got Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine on drums. I think this is an okay record. It's, it's decent, but it feels so much like they're just really trying to mimic the first three Sabbath records. It doesn't feel that inspired. It seems more like fixated on recapturing the past than doing anything new or interesting. But yeah, it's fine. Uh, I think Zeitgeist is probably my favorite track on it. 14, 13. All right, my number 13 is going to be Tyr, T-Y-R. You guys nailed it. It's not quite as epic or devilish, it is a little bit more rockin', like a little bit faster tunes, like on Lawmaker, but, you know, it's pretty much the other record, just about Norse gods. And by now, I, like, I still like what Iomi's doing, but it's kind of just, like, not evolving at all. He's just kind of, like, in that, like, classic metal status. I do it better than most, and but he's not, like, I want something a little more interesting out of him. Um, the next one, at number 12, probably going to be a controversial pick, but I've got Never Stay Die. Maybe objectively better than I'm giving it credit, but it's just so disappointing for that classic Black Sabbath period. I'm not crazy about technical ecstasy, although I like it more, but I don't think they've fixed any of the things that I don't like on this. I think they've kind of lost their identity by that point. The title track's like too cheerful. The whole album is just too bland for like an original Black Sabbath album. Songs kind of meander, very unfocused. Even Tony is reined in a little bit, um, doesn't do too much to excite me. Um, the next album, uh, number 11, or everything else is stuff that I think is pretty decent, pretty good. Um, I wanted to get in the top 10, but I've got Mob Rules. Probably hurts just because it's almost like a carbon copy of Heaven and Hell, um, especially the track listing and like the sequencing is almost exactly the same thundering first two songs and like an acoustic one in the third spot full of fantasy lyrics um you know it's very riff heavy pretty nice yeah it's a nice like you know it's not black sabbath it's dio sabbath um dio's my second favorite front man of the group but yeah so mob rolls at number 11 all right starting off uh let's see we're on 13 i guess my 13 and i think at this point i start to like these albums, fair amount, not, I, I think they're all much more interesting and better than everything that has come before it. Uh, number 13, I got Born Again. This is the one with Ian Gillen, right after Dia lefts. And we got, you know, sort of, it, it's weird to hear, especially after Dio, because I think Dio fits with Black Sabbath, obviously really well. And this one is like, it's almost there. And it, it's, it's good. I, I like the tracks, everything except Digital Bitch, which is bad. 
Uh, but trash is great. It sounds like Deep Purple. Like it's, it almost doesn't sound like Last Sabbath anymore, but it's still good. Uh, and I think Tony Iommi sounds great on it, of course. I think Ian Gillen works for this. It's, I mean, you kind of have to take out the equation that, okay, this is Black Sabbath. It, it has to sound a certain way. But I think if you listen to it, you know, it's still a good album, even if it's not quite Sabbath, as you know it. Still good. Uh, number 12, one that we disagree on. I have Eternal Idol at 12, and I think it sounds pretty cool. This is the first of Tony Martin, but he didn't, it's a weird one, because he didn't do the writing of the vocal parts. Someone else wrote the vocal parts, and he sang them pretty much note for note. I don't know, maybe I just don't like Tony Martin singing that much. I think he sounds a little more reined in here. Uh, he still kind of sounds like a generic Coverdale mixed with um, Lou Graham, pretty much. But uh, Bob Daisley is on here playing bass, and I love him. I think the songs are just better, a little more energy. It's, you know, it's pretty much hair metal, but I, I think it's pretty good. Number 11, I got, and I think starting here, this is a four-star album for me. I, everything else, obviously, is going to be even more than four stars. Uh, I got Seventh Star. And again, this is like, it basically sounds like Deep Purple, but... I think the whole album just kicks ass. Like it's really good, uh, even if it's not quite the Black Sabbath you know and love, but Glenn Hughes has just such a great voice. It's soulful, it totally clashes with what normally you think of Black Sabbath, but uh, Iommi has some of his best riffs here, some really cool gnarly solos. And if you can get past the fact that it sounds like Deep Purple, uh, it's a great album, so. Uh, this is probably the one that I didn't know of that I liked the best. So, hey, you know, sometimes you just got to bring in the purple vocalists when you have no one else. And it works. It just works. All right. My number 13 is Seventh Star. And this was originally intended to be a Tony Iommi solo album. And then the record label was like, eh, why don't we just call it Black Sabbath? That's why it says Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi. It's, you know, very much an 80s metal production. I don't know. The production isn't great. Some of the power ballads are kind of corny, but I still really like it. Glenn Hughes is one of my favorite rock singers of all time. Uh, his voice is still to this day absolutely incredible. And I think on this record, he's not 100%. I think maybe he's singing at about 80%. Uh, he's definitely sounded better throughout his career at, at times, but... He can sing the phone book and, I, and I'll enjoy it. So I like it. You also got uh, Dave Spitz on bass, Eric Singer on drums. So pretty good lineup. Number 12, I've got Dehumanizer, uh, the return of Dio. I think Tony Iommi really just ups his game when, when these other people are involved. I mean, Dio brings a, a lot more to the table than Tony Martin, but I think just the fact of having him there really makes Tony like bring his A game. I think the riffs on this are a lot better than they are on a lot of the other uh, records before and after it. I really like Computer Gods, TV Crimes is Cool, Sins of the Father, One. I think those are all great. Um, and I think Geezer's bass playing is really good on it as well. And then number 11, I'm with Joe. I've got 11 Black Sabbath albums that are at least four stars. I really like this album and I wish I could have gotten it into the top 10 but not quite. They just have too many other good albums. But at 11, I have Born Again. On paper, Ian Gillen seems like a really weird pairing, but I do think it works pretty well. Lyrically, not at all. Ian Gillen's never been a strong lyricist, even with Purple. It's not his uh, strong suit. But I think sonically, it really works. His high screeching really sounds cool on this record, especially on the opening uh, track, Trashed. You know, his cackling on Disturbing the Priest is really cool. I like the title track and Hotline. I think there's a lot of good songs on this. This is kind of a cult record. It has a bit of a cult following. There's a certain subset of Sabbath fans that really champion this record. And I can see why. So even though it's not in my top 10, I do think quite highly of it. I think that a lot of the cult following for it is because a lot of the songs are covered by a lot of metal artists and probably just kind of live on love the album cover though i know the album cover also got bashed i mean the album was kind of bashed at the time but i think the album cover is brilliant it's it's hilarious and creepy all right we're in the top 10 and this one surprised me the most it's going to be my favorite of the martin era it's going to be headless cross i kind of agree with what you guys said about it it is a little generic and i think you know 
Tony Iommi's got more interesting, gnarly playing elsewhere. His playing's so awesome. I mean, there's not an album where he's not kicking ass. I mean, that just goes without saying. But I kind of like this, like, just grand, like, epic theatrical feel of it. it. It's almost like a, instead of, like, a Christian rock album, it's almost like a satanic worship album, but, like, really mellowed for, like, mainstream. Praising him as the master with, like, this big, full sound behind, epic track layering, title tracks, like, really marching and badass. Yeah, I just think it's epic, kind of evil and dark. It's got, like, this, like, angels and demons kind of feel to it. I don't think he's nearly as good as Dio. Dio's got so much character and, like you said, swagger. But I think this one, he's he's doing a pretty good job as the front man. And, you know, Brian May solo on When Death Calls is awesome. There's not really a song I don't really like on it. Maybe the remake of the song of Eternal Idol, Black Moon, isn't great. But, yeah, I think it's a pretty pretty good album. Although I understand the criticism of it and of Martin in general. But I like the Martin stuff much more than Purple Sabbath. So, yeah, that's my number 10, Headless Cross. My number 10, probably controversial. I don't care. It's the debut Black Sabbath it's a great album, obviously. It's one of the most important albums in metal history. Hard rock history, opening track, pretty much sets the entire mood for their entire discography, at least until Dio comes along. Wizard, great. Love that harmonica intro. Basically, um, and Nib, N-I-B, whatever they call it. Not Nativity in Black. That's a just an urban uh, legend. Uh, great songs. It's just, you know, there's two covers on the back end, An Evil Woman and Warning. Uh, Sleeping Village, not my favorite. So, you know, first half, phenomenal. Second half sort of loses me a little bit. And it's just not as dynamic. You know, the riffs are still really elementary. It's super heavy. It's super hard. Uh, I think the lyrics are more interesting than they probably get credit for. And I think that's in general for all Black Sabbath albums, but it's just not quite what I want to hear. It's a little too ponderous and um, slow for me, but it's still a great album. You know, it's it's at least four and a half stars, four stars, four and a half stars, uh, but they would just do much more dynamic, more interesting things a little later on. All right. So like I said, we were texting a bit about how our lists might be constructed and I said, I didn't do anything too crazy. I think my top 10 is fairly standard. Maybe some people would have Born Again up there in the top 10. Maybe some people would sneak Dehumanizer in there. But I think generally people will be okay with my top 10. But I think people may take some issue with the order of my top 10. And interesting to see Joe putting the debut at 10. Possibly we could be heading in similar directions as far as the top of our list goes, but my number 10 is Heaven and Hell. So I, I love the late period Aussie stuff. Um, that's really my, f- of, the, of the original run, sort of like volume four through Never Say Die. But the one thing you can't say about those albums is that they're streamlined or focused. They're kind of crazy records. So Dio comes in And aside from his voice being very different from Ozzy's, that's the big change on this record. They really focus in. It's a tighter record, really riff-centric, very muscular, kind of powerful record. Kind of blends right in with the new wave of British heavy metal that's um, going on at the time. And it's really, really good. I think probably four and a half stars I'd give it. Um, I think it's great, but I just prefer the kind of weirder Sabbath and... You know, I'm not I'm not a metalhead, so the things that I'm looking for in Sabbath are maybe a little bit different than your prototypical Sabbath fan. I'm with Jason. I've got Heaven and Hell as my number nine. I like it, um, but from the same perspective, like pop rock and classic rock is our forte, and especially indie rock and stuff like that. I like some metal. Um, you know, the brilliance of Sabbath is they kind of bridge that gap, or look at the godfathers of metal so my critiques are a little different than metalheads like jason said and yeah i like that you know like iron maiden brit new wave metal is pretty cool but the authenticity is just not the same without ozzy i think dio is great but this is like a stage attempt of the evil that was very natural with Ozzy, which is why a lot of the Ozzy stuff comes out kind of weird and psychedelic and, you know, hard to put your finger on. 
this sounds like it's you know script to record and but it's still good um children of the seas great um you know like jason said it's they're really letting iomi do the backbone of the work here and putting dio's great voice on top lady evil's cool heaven and hell neon nights i like the first half a lot more um but it's not sabbath it's good but it's not black sabbath so I, I, when I thought about doing this video, I was like, how much am I just going to go? It's good, but it's not Black Sabbath. So I'm just going to do it a little bit, but yeah, nine, number nine, heaven and hell, pretty good record. I just listened to 19 Black Sabbath records and that was the most blasphemy I've heard all day, all week. Ridiculous. I won't stand for it. But for me, I also have a Dio record at number nine, but of course it's not heaven and hell. That would be insane. Uh, I have mob rules which is a great record. It's a little more DOE, I feel like. And I don't think Dio has to sort of pretend to be evil and satanic. I mean, come on, look at his discography. He's right up there with Ozzy uh, as far as evil goes. But I think the songs just aren't quite as good as they are in Heaven and Hell. Voodoo, Mob Rules, fantastic, awesome riffs. Great soloing. Tony really kind of kicks it up uh, as far as the soloing goes, I think, on the on the Dio albums. And there's some interesting stuff here. Country Girl is sort of like this really weird, not metal. I don't even know what genre it would fall into. Uh, you have the really kind of long and drawn out brooding Sign of the Southern Cross, which is great. And uh, Turn Up the Night is very 80s sounding. Uh, maybe a little too much, sort of slipping into that. DOE-ness and away from the Black Sabbath-ness a little bit too much I think but as a whole it's a really strong album but it's just not going to be you know we're in really rarefied air at this point and especially considering it comes after Heaven and Hell I just can't really compare so I have it at number nine it's still a strong really good album uh, but just not quite measuring up to everything that came before it. Another four and a half star record for me, but just a tick better than Heaven and Hell. I've got Mob Rolls at number nine. Um, I like the production on this a little bit more. I think the production on Heaven and Hell is a little bit thin, a little bit brittle sounding, and this is just a little thicker, just a little warmer sounding. I like the songs a little bit better. I think there's more songs on this record that I that I think are like excellent I'll turn up the night i really like even though you're right it is very 80s but it's it's cool i like it i like sign of the southern cross a lot i like falling off the edge of the world the title track is great pretty similar to heaven and hell and maybe it is a little bit more dio than sabbath but i like it i, I think it's really really good all right my number eight was the most pleasant surprise of this listen um a dio album it is dehumanizer which i think like Mob Rules was more Dio. The first one is more him just like replacing Ozzy. I feel like this one is kind of like the best blend, mainly because it's just so heavy and just like kind of like back to basics. It's raw. It's really powerful. Um, I like like the heavy imagery and like the computer god kind of vibe of it. Too Late is awesome. Sins of the Father. I think everyone's playing together really well on this. I don't remember what lineup it was because there's so many to remember. Should have put that in my notes. But yeah, Dio, I think this is his best vocal performance. He's got so much attitude on this, so much character in his voice. He's really like, I think because he's coming back after his first stint, he's got a little bit of bravado where he's like, all right, Tony wants me back. So let's like show him what I got. And I think it was really good. There's not really a bad song on it. I was pleasantly surprised with it. I'm in three star territory easily here. So good albums, very good album. Dehumanizer, my number eight. Better than Heaven and Hell. It's the worst thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Number eight for me. And I think this, well, I mean, I love Mob Rules, but this is definitely a little more interesting. We're getting into kind of the crazy late era Sabbath that just totally off the wall uh, started adding in all sorts of, you know, keyboards and piano and, uh, really changing it up. Uh, so I got Technical Ecstasy at my number eight. It's a really cool album. It's, you know, coming after something is just brutally heavy as Sabotage was. You know, I think they sort of reached the limit of riffing 
on that one. And so they kind of just were like, all right, what do we do now? Let's get weird. Factory Kids is, is kind of standard, but it's not like that super heavy uh, riff. It's a little more uh, speedy. It's a little more, I don't know. It's just not, you know, you hear it and you don't think like, oh, classic Black Sabbath. Uh, but it's a cool song. You Won't Change Me starts to bring in like all sorts of like piano. The title is You Won't Change Me, but it's like a big change for them as far as the structure and the dynamics. Uh, really great uh, guitar solo at the end though by Tony Iommi. He's just like going nuts on it. It's All Right, which has um, Bill Ward singing. And I think he does a pretty good job on this one. Uh, it's kind of like a Paul McCartney, like Beatles pop track on us it's you know again totally just unexpected gypsy another one it's just sort of these weird dynamics like softer a little flamenco guitar comes in more acoustic stuff still have that kind of abrupt changes and multiple parts so it's really cool it's almost like a little more santana action coming in from tony he's, he's definitely not quite the same uh, riff master as he was on early stuff. And then like something like All Moving Parts has this really great funky bass line. And it's just an interesting kind of change for them. They're trying new stuff. I think it works way better than the standard fan. And you know, I, I read in Live Why I was reading their list. They had it like 18th and that's insane. It's not like classic Sabbath, but it's interesting. They're trying new stuff. It all sounds great still. They're still awesome players. And I think Ozzy still sounds good. So it's a really cool album. It is a very good album, I think. So Technical Ecstasy. When did it come out? 76, I believe. Let's say 76. So we're getting into this late 70s, trying new stuff. I think it works. It's a great album. No worry, Technical Ecstasy. Yeah, I, I was shocked when you told me about that lot, loud wire placing. They should have their uh, metal card revoked for that one. Uh, but my number eight, another four and a half star album for me. And like I've said, I kind of prefer this kind of weird, semi-proggy, psychedelic, stoner rock vibe that they have on some of these Aussie albums. And this record is that. But I can't pretend that there's not a slight drop off in quality. And that is on Never Say Die. The recording is a little thin, which doesn't help. I think it's still really good. There's some strong highlights. I really like Air Dance. A Hard Road is really cool. I like the title track a lot. Very Thin Lizzy-esque. And they're, they're like mixing in some like jazz fusion stuff. I don't know. It's really cool. I like it. But I don't think it's as memorable as some of their records immediately prior to this. So really good. Just shy of the five star mark, which we will be at from seven on up. All right, my number seven, I'm still just in three-star territory here, but I've got technical ecstasy. I agree with everything Joe said, um, which, you know, it's not, this critique or review is not hidden. This is, I mean, it's it's a bizarre, weird, like, mashup of 70s influences, uh, but it is really, inf you know, uh, interesting above all else. You know, It's All Right does sound just like a Paul McCartney song. Rock and Roll Doctors, it's got like glam rock vibes to it. I don't think any of the songs are like life-changing Black Sabbath songs, but it is just really interesting album to listen to. Hard to put my finger on sometimes, like how much, just how much I do like it. But, you know, for there, there's such an interesting group of players that it's going to be interesting regardless because it's just so weird and unusually and it's unexpected like every turn you don't see coming it's around a tight dark corner so um yeah i've got it i like it at number seven technical ecstasy my number seven and seven and eight pretty much interchangeable i had them back and forth i did a lot of changes throughout my listening experience uh but this one slots in at seven never say die i just think it's a little more I don't want to say interesting, but a little more memorable for me than Technical Ecstasy. I think the title track is really good right off the bat. You know, I definitely hear the, the Thin Lizzy kind of ness in it. Again, it's not quite that riff heavy style that we're used to from Sabbath, but it's, you know, speedy, almost, you know, not quite speed metal, but you know, it's getting to that point. Uh, Johnny Blade's a little weird, has like these weird synth parts that come in. Uh, but Junior's Eyes, I really like uh, some really awesome uh, guitar work from Tony Iommi, the way uh, 
I think it's, it's toward the end, maybe on like the third verse or something, the guitar kind of like phases in. Sounds really cool. Again, I think Tony Iommi is pretty much always the star. And on this one, he has even more kind of jazzy influences. And I know uh, Ozzy hated that about the whole album, but I think if he'd just given in to a little bit more experimentation on this kind of stuff, it would have worked great. I think the the biggest problem on the whole album is um, Bill Ward's vocals on Swing the Chain don't quite work. I think he sounded pretty good on It's All Right. Doesn't quite have it. <clears throat> We're Swinging the Chain, and there's some like weird sax solos that come in, which isn't probably not necessary for a Sabbath album. But uh, Junior's Eyes, Hard Road, Shockwave has like these cool three-part harmonies almost. Air Dance is really unique and just kind of airy and light and you know not like anything that you've really heard at all from Black Sabbath before. So you know it's got like this twinkling piano and more jazzy soloing on Air Dance. So I think it's really cool. Over to You is great. I just think it's a little after all the heaviness and sort of just crushing riffage that came before it. I think Technical Ecstasy and this one are kind of a, a welcome kind of respite from it. So I really like both. Again, either one could be seven or eight, just sort of like Never Say Die a little bit better than the last time I heard it. So really cool album. I wish Ozzy hadn't quit afterwards, but whatever. We got some Dio out of it. All right. Uh, my number seven is the self-titled debut album. Awesome album. It's five stars from me. It's dark, doomy, heavy, super groundbreaking. There's not many albums that you can credit for inventing a genre. I'm sure that someone in the comments will dispute me saying that, but this is about as close as you can get to just based like creating an entire genre in one fell swoop. So really awesome. But it's kind of like my ranking of the early Zeppelin records, even though I love them. I just think they kind of launched off from here into so many more interesting directions. So even though it's great, and important. I just wouldn't reach for it as often as the things that came after it. So that's why it's at seven for me. My number six is going to be their sixth album, Sabotage. I like it. Up until this point, I think it's kind of their most uninventive album. Back to more like loosely structured. It's kind of like big, wide open, long rockers, great playing, great drum fills, kind of meat and potatoes for them a little bit. I'm missing some of the power and like the evil and the sinister and like the pagan mystical element. And I think it's a bit backloaded for me. It takes a while for me to get into it. I like the thrill of it all. And I love the rivet as the closer, probably my favorite song on it. That is just a killer track. Just missed my top 10 songs. But yeah, for me, Black Sabbath is so much just about the vibe and the identity um, and not, not, talking about just like their image but you know a lot of that comes out in the playing that's great descriptive playing like no one else sounded like the first few sabbath albums and by now i think it's just from for my personal taste what i want from sabbath is just a little bit not formulaic but it's just a little bit run of the mill for them um so that's why it's lower on my list but most of the songs are very enjoyable. I like listening to this record. It is my number six, Sabotage. All right, people are going to hate this one, but I got to do it. Uh, I got Paranoid at number six. It is a five-star album for sure. One of the most important metal albums of all time. You don't have to tell me about the importance of Paranoid. And, you know, I think lyrically, this might be their strongest album a lot of different stuff they're covering. War Pigs, great anti-war song. Iron Man's is a really cool story about an Iron Man who tries to warn Earth of destruction and he gets turned into Iron I, I don't know exactly, but uh, I think it's told really well. The lyrics are really cool. Electric Funeral is all about nuclear war. Hand of Doom is about uh, soldiers coming back from Vietnam, basically just on drugs. And... It is just a fantastic album. Paranoid, I love you know, sort of the speed of it. And I kind of, that's what I'm missing. Uh, I wish there were a couple more sort of faster tempo stuff like Paranoid. It's very sludgy. It's very riff heavy. It's very sort of ponderous. And it just takes its time to get going. But I mean, it's a five-star album. It's great. Every single song on here, except maybe Rat Salad, is fantastic. That intro part to Fairies Wear Boots, um, 
just awesome. I love that kind of high, weird guitar. It's a little psychedelic. It's just a killer album. I just don't listen to it, really. I, I know it very well, but over the past five years or so where I've really been into Sabbath, it's probably one I've listened to, not the least, but I've listened to it less than Technical Ecstasy or Never Say Die or pretty much everything else. And it's just a little slow for me. I like sort of the faster, more interesting Sabbath that would follow kind of right after this. So five-star album, great album, but uh, not quite my favorite to listen to on a Saturday afternoon. So you don't have to feel too bad, Joe. I'm right there with you. My number six is also paranoid, but like you, I think it's a five-star album. It's great. I just really like that later sort of second half of Ozzy's original run with them uh, a lot. So it's hard to sneak up into that territory. I'm running pretty chronological for my next few picks. So yeah, I think this is a really good kind of refinement of the debut. It's just as heavy, but I think it's recorded a little better, sounds a little better. It's got more hooks, both in the vocal melodies and in the guitar parts. I think that everything is really catchy. I never get tired of Paranoid or War Pigs. I can hear them a million times. I have heard them a million times. Still enjoy them. I like Planet Caravan, Electric Funeral a lot. Fairies Wear Boots is great. I am a little sick of Iron Man though. I think being a guitar player, especially that's one of those songs that every beginner guitarist learns. And if you walk into a guitar center, you're going to hear probably five people playing it at the same time, but not together. Uh, it's just one of those omnipresent guitar songs and a little tired of it, but everything else is great. Uh, really good record and uh, just not quite not quite exactly my favorite sabbath all right my number five is gonna be excellent album we're in four to four and a half star territory now volume four wanted to put this a little bit higher but just couldn't because of the strength of the other ones wheels of confusion awesome i mean all these songs are awesome and i love kind of like how it's keeping the original kind of sound and style and vibe but like really just like picking it up um, except for a couple of notes on this album, which are really nice, like changes, absolutely phenomenal. This is known as like their coked out album. Um, it's just got a lot more just like sporadic, spunky energy to it. Snowblind is awesome. Cornucopia. I think the songwriting is getting really interesting. They're not just relying on like the playing so much here. And, you know, it's kind of like the cool, like mythical nature of the lyrics. Maybe their best lyrical album to me, volume four. Don't have too much else to say about it. I think it's a great record. So that is my number five. My number five is going to be, and this one changed around again. Every time I would listen to it, it just would, every album would change. I can't, it's really hard when you have so many five-star albums. And so I pretty much just decided to put them in order of which one I'd reach for on any given day, which one I want to listen to. So my number five, and this will probably, again, piss off people. I got a master of reality. And again, it's such an important album. Uh, Tony Emmy started to down tune his guitar on this to like C sharp. So basically it launched like four new genres. So after already launching metal and then whatever paranoid was more metal. This one is like doom metal and whatever else you want to call it. So basically they're just launching new genres as they go along every album. And this one is just so oppressively like malevolent, like everything on this album, every riff is so good. They're faster now. The whole tempo of this album other than solitude really picks up. Uh, from Paranoid. So, you know, a year later, they're already like, all right, we're tired of the Doom riffage. Let's put a little ass into it, get it going. Uh, another one that's really cool lyrically, Sweet Leaf, obviously, great song about marijuana. But you have songs like Lord of This World, which is sung from like Satan's point of view. Uh, into the Void is another kind of really cool song structure with, you know, a really sort of long and complex story being told and every riff is just awesome you know Iomi and Butler are pretty much just killing it on every song it's great I love the kind of pitter-patter drums on Children of the Grave and that uh, rapid bass intro that kind of sounds like uh, Whipping Post by Almond Brothers it's just so good 
the whole album. I had it higher and then it's a little short. It's like 30 minutes. So I think that's really the only thing that holds it back and Embryo is only 30 seconds long. So it's like seven songs, six songs, Orchid, two instrumentals on here. I think that's the only thing that really holds it back. It's not quite as dynamic and bringing in different structures and different sounds. But again, it's five stars. It's just awesome. Great, 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 great album. It's just, this one came out in 71. So it went up against like five all time classic albums. So again, it didn't make my list in 71, but you know, it was right there. It was like six or seven. So just an awesome album, Master of Real- Reality, number five. Well, if, if that pick is going to piss people off, then we'll be pissing people off together because I've got Master of Reality at number five. And I think this is kind of where you start to see them like pulling away a little bit from what they created with their first two albums, wanting to show that they can do other things with tracks like The Orchid and Embryo and Solitude. But for the most part, it's a very heavy, very rockin' record. I have written that it invents stoner rock, so there's another genre um, that you could argue, especially starting off with Sweet Leaf. And I actually think there's a lot of parts on this record that are a little slower and a little like kind of trudging, like the intro riff to Into the Void and Lord of This World. I really like it. I think it's great. Also a five-star record, really killer stuff, but I think they've got better. All right. My number four is going to be the debut Black Sabbath. I know you guys love it, but I think you should give it a little bit more credit considering you're claiming it invented an entire genre. So yeah, I mean, I get it, but the feel is unlike anything else you've ever heard on an album. And, you know, it's got like that black doom. It's so much more interesting than I think people that don't know what Black Sabbath is. They're like, oh, they're like the satanic heavy metal band with Ozzy Osbourne. It's like, this is so much more stuff going on. It's psychedelic. It's jamming. It's like meandering, amazing playing. I think Ward is one of the most underrated drummers of all time. I think he is doing fills and you know, keeping things rolling as well as any rock drummer really of this time. Um, And I think, you know, I don't really get tired of any of the playing. I know it's not prog rock, but for the people that like bash us that we don't like prog enough, like this is, this is a lot of just long instrumental, amazing, just playing. It's fantastic. Title track's great. The Wizard is so badass. NIB. I don't mind the second half really at all. I know it's probably not as well known as the first half, but Yeah, I think for like a stamp of sound and character and identity and imagery and all of this stuff, for pure artistry, this album deserves a lot of credit. It's a four and a half star album for me. And I think it's amazing. My number four, Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. My number four is going to be volume four. It made my top five in 72. Finally got to sneak a Sabbath in there in the 70s. And this one right off the bat, you can tell things have changed. You got the bluesy sort of intro to Wheels of Confusion. And then it quickly devolves into another riff heavy sludge fest. And then sort of another part comes out of the blue. And this is sort of where I really love what Sabbath has become, which is like all of these songs have like five or six different parts that come in. It's not just straight, you know, verse chorus stuff. It's just like legendary riff after legendary riff after legendary guitar, you know, passage. It's just all amazing stuff. Um, every track on here from the sort of tender piano ballad with the Mellotron that coming in at the end changes. Supernaut, one of the heaviest songs of all time. Ozzy's Ode to Cocaine and Snowblind. And you can just feel the drugs on this album. I think that's probably what's missing from today's music. They're not doing enough drugs because this is their drug period. And it is just so good and so interesting. St. Vitus Dance is like this upbeat kind of peppy number there's just so much going on on this album. It all works. It's all amazing. It's all five-star stuff. Just incredibly cool album. Everybody's playing on it. It's fantastic. And Ozzy, you know, I think he gets better pretty much with every album. And I think by this point, he's really sort of a lot more dynamic than he was on the first two. And even sort of matches his reality. I think um, he's doing some cooler stuff with his voice, a little more confident in it. And uh, yeah, just an incredibly cool, 
all over the place album. And uh, I love every minute of it. Another five star one for me, uh, volume four. All right, me and Joe are staying right in step. I've also got volume four at number four. You've got Sweet Leaf on Master of Reality, and then you go to Snowblind on this album, and that pretty much tells you all you need to know. The drugs have changed. Things are getting weird, but it's awesome. The sound on this record is a little bit muddy, but in a good way. It's like grimy and dark. Still got the heaviness of the early records, but you're taking so many different sonic detours on this record. You've got like the uh, really awesome drum break in Supernaut. They start incorporating these like jazz rhythms almost in places. There's really pretty moments like Laguna Sunrise and Changes. It's just a really, really awesome record. Like Joe said, everything works pretty much. And uh, also starting on this record and going till the end of Ozzy's initial tenure with the band, I don't know exactly what it is, but they start treating Ozzy's vocals in a certain way. Just the way it's recorded sounds so good. It's a certain reverb or delay or something on his voice, but his voice from this record through Never Say Die is some of my favorite vocals ever. I love the way they sound. I definitely agree with that. I think he sounds great on volume four. And I believe in our underrated singers or singers with unusual voices or something like that, whatever video we did side three, I believe we talked about Ozzy a little bit. Doesn't get enough credit as a a singer really just as like a front man, but all right. My number three, this is really close. I give it four and a half. It's very close to five stars. The top two for me are five star masterpieces. I've got Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. It's awesome. Very like artistic and a bit different for them. It's almost like sweeter and prettier at times for them. I mean, it's not an ABBA album for God's sakes, but for them, it kind of falls in that rain. And it's really interesting. The songs are like tight and very cohesive, but at the same time, everything's like kind of sprawling both in its construction and its sentiment. And there's like some pretty acoustic guitars and some like awesome booginess on it at times. The piano's coming in. They're less ferocious and getting more into like Zeppelin grooves almost. It's very cool. I think Geezer and Bill Ward right now are like in sync like they haven't been, or at least in a different way. I don't want to say they're not in sync when they're doing their doom and their heavy stuff, but a little different here. Great closer with Spiral Architect. Plus there's like some newer, weirder elements and some cool texture choices like that creepy sci-fi kind of thing with like, who are you? And I think it's quite melodic for them. And a lot of just interesting production notes, like the reeds or the woodwinds and like looking for today. I don't know why I can't give it five stars, but something in my heart just doesn't. So yeah, I love it. I think Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. It's great. Number three. You gotta let the evil into your heart, Cramler, and just give it that extra half star because it is a five star album. I think I love the evil of my top two in that first like three album run a little more so this one is like a little of them they're just, i'm just like more aware of them as like a band right now and like these arts artistic approaches they wanted to do so i think that's might be the half star so i think you accidentally nailed it well uh not quite uh, sabbath bloody sabbath for me yet uh we got to stop off at number three and that's going to be sabotage right from the big, from the bat on hole in the sky. Ozzy like takes his register up like an entire step and he sounds really different and really angry and just awesome. I think this is probably my favorite vocal album of Ozzy's. And this is another one. It sort of takes the stuff that they had been doing on volume four and Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, those sort of, mishmash dynamic riffs like there are no choruses on this whole album other than like the first track everything is just like ridiculous riffs and awesome guitar passages after another sometimes they repeat sometimes they just keep going off in all these different directions symptom of the universe that really kind of heavy chugging part and then it turns into like something super dynamic and interesting uh, megalomania starts off with like, the slow haunting dirge then like the swinging piano comes in and it just goes off in all these awesome directions i love the thrill of it all that opening bluesy kind of and then turns into heavy riffs and then it gets softer and it, it just every song on here just is so dynamic and interesting and then the centerpiece the coup de gras the writ when ozzy comes in and just Oh man, 
whatever he's singing, I think he's singing about his their ex manager. And it's just so venomous and just raw and just so awesome. One of my all time favorite vocal performances. And then it even kind of devolves into this sort of like almost optimistic. He's singing, everything is going to work out fine. And then if it doesn't, I'm going to lose my mind. So it's just, it's humorous. Like the writing on these uh, albums, I think does not get enough credit for how good the, the lyrics are often. And Sabotage, man, really moved up my list. I had it a lot lower coming into this, what I thought it was going to be. But if, if I'm being honest, right now, I think I want to listen to Sabotage the most out of any of these albums. But historically, I got to go with what sort of has always been my favorite. So I'm keeping it number three, but it's five stars. Of course, it uh, came out in 1975, my favorite musical year of all time. So it didn't make my top five, but... I don't know, it, it might now. It's it's just so good. Uh just an awesome album. You do you seem you seem giddy about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's one of those like discovering ABBA or Elvis Costello kind of moments for me. It's just like this is even better than I could have dreamed. It is really, really good. And it's our fourth one in a row that we line up on. I've got sabotage at number three. It's tough to follow you after that. I agree with pretty much everything you said. It's awesome. Takes you on so many twists and turns, unexpected places. The jazzy kind of acoustic section at the end of Symptom of the Universe is so incredible. Megalomania is awesome. Am I Going Insane? Hole in the Sky is fantastic. So many good songs. I think the production is really, really good on it. Also, Ozzy still sounds great on this one. It's really, really good. Number three, Sabotage. Ah, look at you two. Jason would listen to a Frisbee if it were in a record sleeve and had a 1975 copyright print in the corner. So I'm not saying it's a bad album, but that's your sweet spot. All right. Down to what I would assume most Sabbath or classic rock enthusiasts assume are the top two. You guys have already talked about them, which I think is kind of ridiculous, but I got to go with the one that actually did make one of my album of the year nominations, and that is Paranoid from 1970 as my number two. I love it. What more can you say about it? I mean, Joe already hit it. It's very, they're aware of like their power and their status and everything's very doom and heavy and thick and just you know in your face it's not too fast it's just like everything sinks in and is just really like cemented with power war pigs like joe said one of the best anti-war songs ever paranoid i the paranoid iron man i'm fine with um you know even though they're played out i was at guitar center yesterday i bought a new guitar slide and a couple of harmonicas but didn't hear anyone playing iron man because you're not allowed to play guitars right now because of the pandemic but yeah, Electric Funeral, the only thing, like I don't mind Rat Salad and, you know, Fairies Wear Boots, but I think for like a literal start to finish, my number one is just like barely a percentage point more complete than this. And that's the only reason I don't have it at number one. But I think this is great. It deserves all of the attention it gets. Paranoid, 1970, number two in my book. Well, we're down to the top two here. And do I dare put a Dio fronted Black album, Black Sabbath album at number one? Uh, I dare not. Uh, number two is going to be Heaven and Hell. And I, I mean, I love this album more than, I don't know, anyone. It was my winner in 1980, one of my favorite years of all time. So it, by no means just a product of its year. And I think from front to back, this is the one I want to listen to. This is what I listen to monthly. And I think it might have to do with the production. Uh, they got Martin Birch for this, who went on to do like all the Iron Maiden albums. And it's just so different sounding. You know, it's not as sludgy. The bass is so upfront. Geezer Butler's, he's practically playing like lead bass on a bunch of these songs. It's like McCartney-esque almost but of metal and he pretty much is driving the whole album. It's him and Dio obviously, but really the hero for me on this is, is Geezer Butler. I think it's some of the best bass work ever on an album. It's not quite as flashy as, you know, an Iron Maiden or a Rush album or anything like that, but 
it's just so melodic and interesting and sort of against the archetype of metal. And Dio just rules on it. Every song, I don't know how they did it. It's not lightning in the bottle because they've been doing this forever, but the way they were able to switch vocalists, pretty much switch styles. It's really nothing like what they've been doing with Ozzy, but it, it works so well. It's still very dynamic, long, very cool guitar parts by Iommi. I think maybe his best work, not, not quite as interesting as the stuff he was doing with Ozzy, but as far as like pure oral pleasure, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, albums of all time, one of my favorite metal albums of all time, front to back, just every song I love. I could do an entire top 10 just from this album. So I love it. I remember the first time I heard it, I'd sort of just always ignored the O'Hara Black Sabbath. I was like, ah, eh, it can't be any good. It's not a, no Aussie, come on. Then I heard it, I heard one track off of it. I was like, okay, I gotta explore this more. And I, you know, I've listened to it a bajillion times in the past five years, maybe more than any other album, save for ABBA Arrival. So I love it. I love every minute of it. There's not a single moment on this album I don't love. So number two, it's not number one because it's not quite as interesting, I think, as the Aussie Black Sabbath. And I'll admit that, but I still think for like just putting on and listening to an album, this is one of my all-time favorites. All right. My number two... Joe and I finally diverge, but this might be the one that causes the most controversy in the whole whole video. But number two for me is Technical Ecstasy. I absolutely love this record. It's so underrated. And I know the general consensus is that it's one of their weaker albums, at least weaker among the original Aussie run. But I don't I don't get it. I don't know why people don't like it as much. I think Backstreet Kids. You Won't Change Me, Gypsy, All Moving Parts Stand Still. I, I don't know how you can argue that these songs aren't amazing. They're so good. The only thing I can really think is that when this album first came out, people just turned their back on it because of It's All Right and not wanting to hear a piano ballad sung by the drummer. But I like It's All Right, too. I think it's a really good song. I think Bill Ward does a great job on it. Front to back, I love this entire record. I think it's awesome. This is maybe kind of analogous to me loving Rock in a Hard Place or In the Ruts as much as I do, but I just don't understand what people are missing or why they don't like it. I think it's clearly an amazing album. I think I should move it up to number seven. I can't because I've already said it, but yeah, it's, it's really good. I don't understand why people don't like it. It's good, but you're blowing it way out of proportion considering that you have it above Master of Reality, which is the best Black Sabbath album. It is the embodiment of amazing heavy metal writing. Every lick of attitude and power and doom is in these guitar parts and bass and drums, sweet leaf, like you don't have to go and shred and go nuts. These simple guitar parts just have so much character and attitude in them and, you know, just confidence behind them. After Forever, Children of the Grave. It's so badass. Badass is the word for these songs. And the reason why I probably have it on Paranoid is I think these songs stand out on their own a little bit more. I got more in my top 10. I also like how it ends with Solitude and Into the Void a little more. And probably my personal little favorite piece of the album is that little touch of Orchid. I think it is absolutely cool as hell. Very pretty. It's, it's awesome because, you know, they're not just like this classic evil biblical devil band. They've got like that pagan in touch with nature and smoking weed kind of like more realistic approach. It seems so authentic. And I think it's great. Um, and not surprisingly, it is from 1971. One of many, many, many five-star albums that I don't think we can even talk about from the greatest year ever in music. So it is my number one. Master of Reality, 1971, my number one. All right, well, uh, I guess me and Jason have the same number one album, which I'm not, I, I guess I would have been surprised until I realized how much Jason liked Black Sabbath. So this makes sense for him. Uh, Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, my number one. I think it's just, you know, all of these albums are great. They're all five stars from this period, pretty much. And I think what does it for me on this one is they sort of went into the studio really wanting to like, just kick things up a bit. They wanted to really put in the work and put together a masterpiece. 
I think they nailed it. Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, the the track leading off, just one of those amazing riffs. It's got that dynamic sort of nature where it's changing. You know, it, it almost feels like two songs, but it just flows together perfectly. It's not sort of like mashed up and stuck in it. It just works. It flows beautifully. Uh, you have weird tracks like a National Acrobat, which is about like being born. You have Spiral Architect, which is about DNA. Like they're really reaching for kind of weird places for all this stuff. And I, I think it's you know a little more contemplative, a little more dynamic even than, than Volume 4. Uh, you have the super hard, like bluesy deep purple riff that opens up uh, Sabracadabra. And then Rick Wakeman comes in on piano and just like playing this boogie piano. Just really cool stuff. Killing Yourself to Live has like four or five different passages. Uh, some of my favorite Tony Iommi guitar work, just really memorable riffs all over this place, dynamic. Looking for Today has some kind of weird something that comes in at the end. Just all this stuff that you wouldn't expect from Black Sabbath, uh, you know, flute. I think it's a flute on, um, on Looking for Today. And it, it's just kind of mind blowing the different strands and the different kind of styles that they bring into this. It all works so well though. There's, there's nothing forced about it. Nothing that seems like out of place. It's just, is fantastic. Even Fluff, the instrumental is pretty cool. It's just a, a killer album. I always come back to it, I think, over pretty much anything else um, in the past five years. It just has this sort of like completeness that I love and a little more listenability than Master Reality or Paranoid for me just because it's so dynamic and uh, interesting. So it's my number one Sabbath. Uh, yeah, I don't know how normal that is. I guess Jason feels the same way. I haven't seen anyone else, any of the other magazines and stuff that I was browsing looking for sort of fair rankings. But for me, nothing beats a good old Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. My number one from Black Sabbath. Yeah, um, Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, number one. It's awesome. I think every song on it except for Fluff was in the running for my top 10 songs. Just really unique, adventurous, daring, strange, exciting. Tony Iommi's guitar tone on this is really unique, really cool. Ozzy sounds great as uh, Joe mentioned the uh, i think the secret ingredient on this record is rick wakeman dropping in these really bizarre synths and just all kinds of little extra touches on this record yeah it's fantastic like we said about so many of the other records from this era it just kind of takes you on this journey the songs don't go where you think they're going to go and then they go somewhere else after that it's just really 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 good fantastic i love it N another five-star album for me black sabbath and your hot take in the messenger was that you were ready to publicly say they were better than dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Well, so first of all, it's crazy that they never made a top five for me in albums of the year. Uh, they've got seven albums that I think are five star. And I was looking, I'm not sure that any of them still would crack a top five. Some of them are kind of like teetering on maybe being able to crack a top five. Seventies are just so, so loaded. But for a band to have seven five-star albums is pretty impressive. And I am ready to say that I like Black Sabbath more than Led Zeppelin. I've really, really enjoyed listening to this discography, especially the first half with Ozzy and uh, the first two Dia records. They're all fantastic. For me, I, I think the only thing that holds Sabbath back from being like a top five band for me all time is just their their second half and it's unfair because i always go back to zeppelin they just had the exact right amount of albums there was nothing to be like well i hate that album by zeppelin so i can't say they're my favorite uh, you know band of all time but as far as like number of four and a half to five star albums i mean other than zeppelin and maybe like the beatles I don't know if there's any other band that has as many albums uh, that are at that level for me. Uh, we'll have to do a show about it because I want more time to think, but I mean, Sabbath over the past five years is just really, I always kind of thought they were kind of lame, not lame, but like a little overrated back in the, the day. 
when I was a teenager, even into college. But ever ever since uh, I heard Heaven and Hell, and I kind of launched me on an exploration of Sabbath a couple of years ago, they just rocketed and rocketing up my charts for all time favorites. Yeah, they're definitely in my top hundred. I don't know where they fall, ma- mainly just because they're in such like a specific corner of my listening. Like, you know, there's not nothing really else among my favorite artists sounds like Black Sabbath. They're not in the same group as pretty much else. So kind of forget about them a little bit. And I also conveniently block out the stuff I don't like. But like, man, those like top five, six albums, I think, are among the best ever. Um, but yeah, hard to get them in for our albums of the year series because it's the seventies. So yeah, but yeah, I, I love black Sabbath. I like Dio Sabbath. I don't mind Martin Sabbath and I don't really like purple Sabbath. I gotta say they are in the history of raw criticism, wildly underrated and unfairly castigated to the, you know, oh, they're too metal. They're too dark and satanic. Just ridiculous. They had so little respect. And, Especially uh, as individual players. I mean, other than Iomi, Bill Ward is an amazing drummer. Geezer Butler is a good bass player. Ozzy is a great singer. Like, it's, they don't deserve, you know, like, the shunning of, like, not getting thrown in with the all-time greats. As always, I blame Rolling Stone for this because they trash their albums when they came out, although they started to come around, I think around volume four. Yeah. They, they really hated black Sabbath, the, uh, the self-titled in 70. Yeah. I would say if you've, if you're not a metal fan and you've avoided black Sabbath because of that, give them a shot, especially that period that I'm talking about from like volume four through technical ecstasy, where things get really weird and psychedelic and proggy and druggy. It's really, really awesome stuff. Really unique stuff too. Nothing else sounds like those records. But all right, let us know how you enjoyed our lists. Let us know what your lists are. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, hit the bell for notifications. Head over to our channel. We've got a poll up. Um, If you haven't voted yet, it'll be up for another week or two. Um, Some good choices for one of the uh, next artists that we'll cover. And we will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.